All right, so we'll quickly review here, guys. Um, so our first one, we've got tetranitrogen trisulfide. The prefixes would indicate this is what kind of compound? Molecular. Okay, so what uh, number do I need to put on the nitrogen? Four. Okay, and on the sulfur? Trisulfide, N4S3. Everybody all right with that one? Okay, for number two, we've got calcium fluoride. Okay, ionic or molecular? Ionic, calcium is a metal. All right, so we've got Ca, okay, and I write its charge, two plus, and fluorine, its charge is minus one. All right, so when I do this, I'm gonna drop and swap. The one will go here, but we don't write ones. We'll get a two there on the other side of fluorine. Okay, so we want to uh, go over here basically looking at the differences between ionic compounds and molecular compounds. This time not in so much in terms of their naming, but in terms of um, how they act, how they look, their chemical and physical properties and, and things of that nature. Because on Monday, when we're doing our first lab, you will be given, I think it's 12, 12 unknown compounds. They'll be in beakers labeled A through K. What? K? Whatever the 12 letters, K or J. Okay, they'll be labeled A through K. Um, and you're gonna have to, using just their physical properties, identify. Okay, easiest way, or the first thing probably you'll wanna do is decide whether they're ionic molecular, okay, things of that nature. So what we're gonna go over today are, how are some ways you can tell one compound from another? And especially ionic compounds versus molecular compounds. Right? So um, when you're listening today and adding to your notes package, think about things that might be important if you had an unknown substance in front of you and you were trying to figure out what it was. Okay? So give you an example. Two of your unknowns that you'll have on Monday are sugar and salt. Okay? They're both white crystalline solids. Right? Since you can't taste them, because some of the ones that will be in the unknowns are like hazardous, okay? tasting is not an option. Right? We gotta be able to tell which one is salt and which one is sugar just by other physical properties. Okay? So that's the kind of thing we wanna think about. Okay, I'm looking at these two things, I know one of them is salt, one of them is sugar, how can I figure it out? Okay, I'm gonna go over some ways that you be able to do that without just going okay, like that. Okay. Because that would be a, like a very bad COVID thing. Okay, all right, uh, so we're gonna learn the properties of compounds, acid, bases, ionic, molecular, understand how those properties can be used to identify a compound, which will be useful for a lab design, which we will start maybe tomorrow, for sure Friday. Okay, so first off, all matter has certain properties. Some are chemical properties, okay, like reactivity, okay, and some are physical properties, okay, things like color, density, melting point. What else would be a physical property? Density. Okay, so we got density here, okay, color, melting point, what else? Okay, structure, yeah. Okay, I think within structure we could maybe also include like texture. Okay, if something is crystalline or waxy or metallic, right? That would all be kind of within texture. If it's like this, if it's viscosity. Viscosity, yeah. yep. Uh -huh. Probably won't be all that important for the lab we're gonna do, viscosity, okay? Um, but it's certainly a physical property. What else? Solubility. Solubility, that one will be really important. How can I tell an acid from the base? Two letters. It has to do with that. pH, right. Okay. P the pH scale is the power of hydrogen. Okay. And we'll talk about kind of where that name comes from, but all acids contain hydrogen ions in them. And, and so it's basically a logarithmic scale. Okay, what else? Mustard. Mustard.
some things can do this and others can't has to do with moving electrons. Conductivity. Yeah, conductivity. Another, another one, some things can do this, some things can't, they can be attracted to certain metals. Yeah, whether they're magnetic or not. Okay, whether they can be attracted to a magnet or whether they themselves are magnetic. Okay, or physical properties. All right, so a lot of these are going to be important when we're um, basically just writing down some of the simple things we can observe. There's one simple thing we can observe that we haven't written down yet. And just think of our senses. Smell. Smell, yeah. Right? Some things have a very obvious odor. Okay, sulfur smells like rotten eggs. We add it to natural gas. Natural gas has no smell. You never detect a leak. Okay? You add sulfur to it in order to make it stick. Okay? So we can detect if there's a leak. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of go over how these things could be used in our lab situation. Because one of the things we're going to do is simply record the observable physical properties. Simple things like color, texture, odor, and okay? stuff like that. Because here's another example of two things that will be in your lab. You'll have two liquids. One will be water, and one will be ethanol, which is alcohol. Okay? From a distance, they both look the same. They're both molecular compounds. They'll have pretty much all the same results, except one will smell okay? quite strongly, and the other will. Right? So all of those little things okay, are going to add up to, okay, that's, those two things are completely alike except for this one thing, and I know that this one does have a smell, that one doesn't, so this is alcohol, that's water, okay, and so on. So how we narrow it down. All right, so for ionic compounds, ionic compounds typically exist as crystalline solids or salts okay, at room temperature. So from here on out, when you see this formula, you may no longer call that salt in this class anyway, okay? Because salt is actually a general term for any ionic compound in crystalline form, okay? All ionic compounds are technically salts, okay? NaCl is obviously table salt, okay? But it's, right, um, it's, a, it's a specific salt. Salt is a general term, okay, applied to all ionic compounds, okay? They have very high melting points, right? So, um, like we're talking hundreds of degrees Celsius. Okay, very, very high melting points. So you're not gonna put an ionic compound in your hand and have it melt. Okay? Whereas with something like butter, which is a molecular compound but is solid, put it in your hand and it starts gets off. Okay, coconut oil, same thing, right? If you don't have air conditioning on a hot day, your coconut oil liquefies in the pantry. Okay, about 25, 26 degrees, coconut oil melts. Okay? It's a great way to get it you know, off the sides of the container. Okay. Um, ionic compounds will conduct electricity when they are in solution. Okay. This is crucial. This is the test that will tell the difference between your ionic and molecular compounds. Molecular compounds do not conduct electricity when they are dissolved in solution. Ionic compounds do. Right? We call that aqueous conductivity. Right? Doesn't mean that the solid part of them conducts when they're dissolved in water. Okay? The reason ionic compounds do that is when you put them in water, and we talked about this like the second day, okay, they dissociate. That is, the bond, the ionic bond breaks because it's very weak, and these charged particles separate. Okay? Each of them having their outer shell full, so they're happy. Okay? So if we put salt in water, okay, little positively charged sodium ions will be floating around. Negatively charged chlorine ions will be floating around. Because there are charged particles in the solution, electrons can pass from one to another, and thus the solution conduct electricity. If I just have pure distilled water, this, that will not conduct electricity because there are no ions floating around in it to allow the electrons to pass through. Okay, So any molecular compound will be like that. When you dissolve molecular compounds, they don't dissociate, which is typically why 
plant, um, molecular compounds, sorry, are not as soluble in water as ionic compounds. Okay. All right, that sort of makes sense there. Okay, so ionic compounds will conduct electricity in solution, always. Okay, whereas molecular will not. Right. So, would that help you tell the difference between sugar and salt? Yes. Every other way, they look the same. They both dissolve in water. But as soon as you put the conductivity tester in the solutions, you'll know which one is which. Okay? Because sugar is a molecular compound. C6H12O6 is glucose. Okay? That's a molecular compound. All right. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so obviously they're crystalline solids. Every ionic compound has a slightly different crystalline shape. You can sort of tell that visually, okay, with, with our eyes without any magnification or anything, but it becomes especially evident if you have a special type of microscope that observes crystalline structure, okay? It, like if you really know what you're looking for, you can tell one compound from, a net, from another based on the structure, but we are not gonna be there, okay? Do salt and sugar look different? I mean, they're both clear, white, crystalline solids, but if you look pretty closely, their crystals are different, okay? They do look different. Okay, um, some ionic compounds, their crystals are colored. The color is based on the metal. Certain metals produce certain colors of salts, okay? Most are clear, but there are some metals that have brightly colored salts, okay? And nickel is an example, okay? Nickel always produces green have a green crystalline solid, it likely contains nickel. All right, would that be useful if one of your unknowns was like nickel chloride? Yeah, okay. if you've only got one green material, it's pretty likely that that's the nickel chloride. Right? Now, you'd still want to run your other tests, make sure it conduct electricity in solution, etc. Okay, but obviously that would be its kind of defining characteristic. Okay, so like we said, ionic compounds can produce, or certain metals can produce ionic compounds that are brightly colored. Nickel is gonna be green. Cobalt compounds can be anywhere from like blood red to faded pink. Okay, but they're always gonna be reddish pink. Cobalt compounds will always be reddish pink. And copper containing compounds are blue. Okay. That's why when, when uh, like bronze statues start to, um, or pen, brass sometimes start to age and oxidize, they turn kind of greenish, okay? It's because the copper alloy that they're made out of is starting to oxidize and produce ionic compounds that are bluish green in color, okay? All right, so those will be important because you could have a copper containing compound, spoiler alert, you do, okay? And um, you could also have a cobalt containing compound, you do, okay? Okay, now molecular compounds can be solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. You will not have any molecular compounds that are gases to test in this lab. Why? I don't know how we would put them in a beaker. Yeah. They, they still stay there. They don't stay put. Okay, so we don't have any, any molecular compounds that are in gaseous form because they're just really hard to contain and keep in the lab. They just like want to escape always and go somewhere. So you won't have any of those, but we will have some liquids. We will have some solids. Okay. Um, so if you have a liquid, it's pretty much a dead giveaway that it's not an ionic compound then, because we already said ionic compounds have high melting points, somewhere in the hundreds of degrees. So none of them are going to be liquids at room temperature. Okay. So basically anything that's a liquid will be a molecular compound, which can help you know, narrow down its possible identities for Okay, um, molecular compounds are not usually as soluble as ionic compounds, not usually, doesn't mean they can't be, sugar's quite soluble, okay? Um, and their solutions do not conduct electricity, okay? We already talked about why that is, okay? For an ionic compound, we've got charged particles, okay? We've got our negatively charged ions, our positively charged ions. For a molecular compound, when it dissolves in solution, it does not dissociate, because there are no charges to be balanced, okay? So they stay together and there's no ability to electrons through. Okay. Um, typically they also produce clear solutions. There are not a lot of brightly colored 
okay, molecular solutions. Okay. The other thing about the uh, solids, okay, you can get some crystalline solids. Obviously, sugar is one of them. But most of the solids are softer, waxier, oily, okay, that kind of thing. So like butter, coconut oil at room temperature, they're soft, waxy like solids. Okay? Um, so if you have something that is a solid but it's not crystalline, then it's also not ionic. It would definitely be molecular. Okay? So these are the kind of things, pro thought process we have to start going through when we're trying to identify our compounds. Okay, molecular compounds, like we said, which are soluble in water, usually produce clear solutions, okay? If I take alcohol and water and I mix them together, they just dissolve in one another, okay? And their solution is clear, all right? If they don't dissolve in one another, then they'll separate, okay? Like when you put oil and water together, okay? They just separate into different layers, right? That's a sign that they're not soluble. If they are soluble, they just disappear. Looks like one unit. Okay, but if they if they are not soluble, then obviously they will separate. Okay, acids. There's two kinds of acids: strong acids and weak acids. Okay, strong acids all contain well, actually all acids contain hydrogen ions. Okay, hydrogen acting as a metal. The strong acids are ones that dissociate most easily. Okay, weak acids tend to be um, kind of more complex. Their their molecules are bigger, and okay? they don't break down as easy. They don't dissociate as easily, so they tend to be weaker. Citric acid is an example. Okay, it's almost like a molecular compound. Okay? Um, but strong acids dissociate easily, and they always contain H plus ions. The more easily the compound can dissociate, or the more H plus ions it contains, the stronger the acid will be. So, as an example, this is a common strong acid, hydrogen chloride. You've probably heard it called hydrochloric acid. It is the acid that is in your stomach. Okay? It helps you digest food. Okay? When it hits water, it dissociates into H plus and Cl minus, okay? which is why it's an acid. It can give off a positively charged hydrogen ion. Okay? If it splits into those two ions, then that means its solution will also do what? Okay, is this compound ionic or molecular if it does this? It's ionic. Hydrogen is acting as a metal. Okay. All ionic compounds do what when they're in solution? Conduct electricity. Okay. In fact, your strong acids will be your best conductors because they most easily dissociate into their charged parts. Okay. Is that why acids are used in patterns? Uh, yes, partially. Yeah. Um, it's also certain um, electrochemical reactions are best catalyzed by an acid. It's usually like a sulfuric acid with a lead catalyst, which is why the plates in it, I think you're thinking of a wet cell battery, right? Yeah. Our lead plates, that's why one battery weighs like 60 pounds. Okay. If you've ever tried to pick up a battery, first off, make sure that it's not leaking before you pick it up because it's got acid in it. Okay. But secondly, they're super heavy because they've got a bunch of lead plates inside okay. that make them super heavy. Okay, um, so hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid is a common acid, okay? Also a common acid, okay? Hydrogen sulfide, okay? How many of you have heard of that one before? If you have any relatives who work in the oil fields, okay? They usually have to take an H2S course and become H2S certified. It is an associated gas with most drilling operations, especially natural gas, okay? Uh, so they have to be careful with that because this stuff can become a gas very quickly or a vapor, and if it's inhaled, it's an acid, it'll eat your lungs, okay? Um, so it's very, very dangerous, especially sometimes within the, the close confines, okay? Like a rig type area, okay? So that one can be pretty harmful. Why would this one be more harmful than this one? 
There's two hydrogens, yeah. It can, when, it hits, when it hits solution, we're going to get H plus, H plus, and S. Okay, so we're getting more hydrogen ions, and the more hydrogen ions that can be donated, the stronger the acid will be, okay? All right, what about this one? Oh, my board is out of line. I got to realign. Okay, what about that one? Pretty strong? Yeah, okay, that's nitric acid. Very strong stuff, okay? Um, and it can turn into a vapor very, very quickly. Okay? Most acids can't. Okay? They can turn into vapors. But this stuff, the vapor is, is well, it becomes a vapor more easily, and uh, the vapor can cling. Okay? So if it gets on your skin, you won't notice it right away, but a few hours later, you'll have deep chemical burns, blistery chemical burns on whatever tissue it contacts. So you have to be extremely careful with that. How would you remove that? Like, uh, if well, you knew you were in contact with it? If you knew you had gotten it on you, then soap and water take care of it. Yeah, you got to do it right away. It's the fact that the problem is that you don't notice it. The reaction is not immediate, right? Anyway, just go, hmm, not think much of it, right? No different than if you, you, know, you put your hand in something and it's like, oh, that was weird, and, and not, not think about it. But the process slowly happens, and pretty, by the time it's been absorbed, then there's nothing you can do. That's why you get the deep tissue blistery burns. It goes through into the lower layers of the skin. Yeah, it can be pretty bad. Okay, but you have to be obviously respectful of all acids. That's why all of our labs have a fume hood. Okay, they have that area where we keep the acid so the vapors can be exhausted okay, out through the top. Um, if you are in the vicinity of them, they can be very harmful. Okay, I've, I've had this one, okay, and even though it's not very strong, I've had it put me flat on my back. Okay, I uh, was mixing some for a lab and I sneezed, and I sneezed right over top of it. And what do you do right after you sneeze? Okay, right out. Freaked out my colleague because when he came to came into the lab prep area, I'm lying on the floor, blood coming up. Okay, like he thought I was dead. Yeah, so not cool. Okay, you got to be careful with those kinds of things. Okay, now the stuff. Okay, there could be that, that's actually going to be one of your unknowns in the lab. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll mix it strong enough that it'll give you the right results, but not so strong that it'll eat a hole in you. That said, don't get it on you because you know. It's still acidic, okay? um, and it's still harmful. So you got to treat all those unknowns with respect because you don't know which one is which. Okay, so uh, acids donate these H plus ions. Okay, um, they taste sour or tart. However, you will not be trying any of them. Okay. How did someone Well, citric acid, right? Sour or tart, right? Vinegar is kind of tart. Right? That's an acid as well. Okay, strong acids want to be like the last thing you taste because it'll eat your tongue, but you can try it. Again. Um, don't try it. Don't try it. Okay. Uh, and they'll turn our litmus indicators okay, from uh, blue to red. Okay, so they'll always be an acidic color. Even on our hydrion paper, which shows the entire pH scale, they'll obviously be quite red. Okay. And acidic solutions have a low pH. That is less than 7. So anything less than 7 okay, uh, is technically acidic. Anything less than 2 is getting towards strongly acidic. Okay. There are lots of things that are mildly acidic, have a pH of you know, 4, okay, that are quite common. Right? Vinegar is an example, citric acid is an example. Okay. Those are weak acids. Okay. They're not, you, know, you can eat them, they're not going to hurt you. Um, acid rain can have a pH you know, 4, even lower sometimes, 3. Okay. It's really bad. That's the kind of places where the trees all die. But it's like that. All right, questions on acids? Okay, so in the lab then, acids will be really good conductors, okay? They'll be, um, obviously have a pH that's very, very low, okay? Um, and be highly soluble in water because they're ionic compounds and they dissociate easily. All right, bases are also ionic compounds, okay? And again, there's strong bases and weak bases, okay? This stuff, fairly strong base. Okay, that's sodium hydroxide. Anybody ever used a spray-in oven cleaner in their oven before? Okay. If you ever are going to, make sure you follow the instructions and use in a well-ventilated area. 
Okay, so the last thing you want to do is while you're spraying and stick your head inside the oven to make sure you're getting all the places because if you inhale that, okay, it will do the same thing and acid will do. It will simply dissolve your lungs. Okay, it's very, very hard and you probably get a nosebleed. Your eyes will burn. Okay, it's really strong, awful stuff. That's why we use it to clean the crud off the inside of an oven. It does a great job of dissolving all of that stuff. Okay, um, it's also uh, a prime ingredient in lye. Okay, so if you ever watch like any crime scene kind of shows, lye is the stuff they use to dissolve dead bodies. Okay, yeah, like it will do that very quickly actually. They also throw it in pit toilets, okay, to kill bacteria and things like that, keep the smell down. Is that the thing they use to break the bag? Um, just use the, the, the body and like the bag I think so. I'm trying to remember that. So it's like big that yeah, I mean, they would have had access to chemicals. All right, um, so bases all have hydroxide ions in them. So they're all going to be ionic compounds, strong bases, that is. Okay, and they're all going to have OH. Okay, so whenever they hit, hit water, okay, they're going to dissociate into the metal and hydroxide. The more hydroxides they can give off, the stronger they will be, okay, or the more easily they dissociate, the stronger they will be. Okay. Uh, and obviously that will make them have a pH that is higher than 7. Okay. All right. What would this stuff be? Water. Water. Okay. We usually write water the way water is actually formed, which is two hydrogens attached to an oxygen, but it can also behave this way, especially if it encounters a strong acid or a strong base. Okay? It acts almost like an ionic compound. Okay? It gives off a positively charged hydrogen ion and a negatively charged hydroxide ion, which is part of the reason why water is neutral. Okay? basically has the thing that makes acids acids and the things that make bases bases, okay? Because it has them in equal numbers, it's effectively neutral. All right, typically acids taste bitter and will turn litmus indicators blue, okay? If you have a really strong base on our hydrion paper, it's like navy bluish black, okay? Like it's, it's really, really dark. Okay? Um, and obviously taste bitter, we're not going to be tasting anything, but if you've ever had anything that's like quite bitter, it's probably somewhat alkaline. Alkaline is another term for base. Okay. All right, questions on the bases? Okay. So, um, in terms of our lab for um, Monday, okay, in a few minutes here, I'm going to talk about some of the tests that we're going to run. I'm going to want you to write this stuff down. Okay, and then we can talk about how you're going to perform those tests. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys maybe about a five minute break here. Okay, I'm just going to run across the lab and grab a couple things. If you need to use the bathroom or whatever, enter some snaps, now is the time. So, like we said, on Monday you're going to get a bunch of unknown compounds. They're just going to be in beakers labeled with letters. Okay. We want to be able to identify them as specific compounds because you'll get a list. Here are the possible identities of these compounds. You're going to have to figure out which one's sugar, which one's salt, which one's hydrochloric acid, which one's nickel 2 chloride, which one is copper 2 sulfate, okay? and so on and so on. You're going to have to figure that out. Okay? So yeah, I'm telling you these are, these are the identities. I'm just not telling you that A is this one or B is that one. Okay? That'll be your job to figure out. All right? So when we're looking at our unknowns, Okay. Before we do any testing on them, what are some things about them that would be smart for us to record or make observations on? Their color. Right. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is what we call the observable properties test. Okay. And it's going to consist of simply recording the easiest most obvious physical properties that don't require us to do anything other than look or smell. Okay. okay, so first thing, most obvious thing to record in the observable properties test is color. Okay, 
because we know some of the ionic compounds that could be in that list could have very distinct colors. Anything containing copper will be blue. Anything containing nickel will be green. Anything containing cobalt will be pink or red. Okay, so it would be a good idea for us to be um, aware of that and looking for those colors. Okay, what's another one? Smell. Smell, yeah, odor. Some things have very definite odors. Okay. Anything in that list where odor is important will have a very obvious odor. Okay? I just say that because I don't want anybody snorting any of the compounds in an attempt to find out what they smell like. Okay? I, I kid you not. Okay? Like, yeah. How do you actually smell an unknown compound? What's the technique? Right. It's called wafting. Okay? So you hold the beaker and you do this. Okay? Now, obviously, we're all going to be wearing masks during this lab. Okay, so the person doing the wafting test is probably gonna have to take the unknown and walk a little bit away from everybody. Okay, pull down their mask and go. Remember, when you're wafting, you're inhaling. Do not exhale onto the beaker that everybody else is going to have to use. Okay, we want to be careful about that kind of stuff. All right, luster. Luster. Okay, might not be all that important for what we're doing because we're not going to have anything that's just a metal. Okay, but luster is important if you're looking at just metals. Okay, here's something obvious, and there's only three of them, but we haven't listed it yet. Like solid gas. State, right? Solid, liquid, or gas. Okay, that's important. We know that if it's a liquid, it's a molecular compound. Right? That helps us out in identifying. So recording the state is definitely an observation we would want to make. Okay. It's texture. Texture, yeah. Okay. And by texture, I mean is it crystalline? Is it waxy? Is it you know, like somewhere in between? You kind of have to decide. But texture is going to be important. Crystalline solids are likely to be ionic compounds, sugar being the exception. Okay. What else might be important that we can just kind of observe without? If it's transparent, translucent, or yeah. So I think we'll just we'll include that under um, nature. Okay, and by nature, uh, I think we would say like, is it crystalline? Okay, if so. Then, um, like, say, translucent, okay, transparent, opaque, okay, whatever. And I would also say that under nature, we might also want to look at crystal shape. Some of our crystalline solids, like, have big crystals, okay? One of your unknowns is going to be little saucer shaped crystals, okay? And those saucers are going to be about the size of like your fingernail, if you have small fingernails like me, okay? Um, it'd be about that big, okay? It'd be about maybe a half to three quarters of a centimeter, okay, in size, whereas like crystals for salt are tiny, okay? They're less than a millimeter each. So we do have some that are bigger, some that are saucer shaped, some that are square, some that are little tiny spheres, okay? All these different shapes. So recording the crystalline shape uh, is, is obviously important as well. All right, I would say that that's a pretty good list of things to be looking for when we're doing our observable properties test. Okay, if there's something else that you notice then, and you think it's important, then by all means record it. Okay? There's no bad observations. Okay, There's having too few, Okay, but you really can't have too many observations. You'll just have things that you won't end up using, which is fine. Better to have them than not have them. Okay? All right. The other tests that we're going to need to run have to do with being able to tell something being ionic or molecular, okay, uh, acid or base, and all of that kind of stuff. So the other tests we're going to have to run are going to be a test for solubility, okay, 
a test for aqueous conductivity and a test for pH. What order should I do those tests in? Okay, and I want you to think about this in terms of I need to preserve the purity of my sample. Uh, I can't test pH unless it's in solution. Right? I have to stick the pH paper in. When I stick pH paper in, the pH paper changes color. And a change in color usually indicates that a chemical reaction is occurring. Once I test pH, is it possible that I have now contaminated my sample? Yes. pH, we want to do last. Okay? If I'm going to test the conductivity of the solution, it needs to be in solution. So which one should come first, solubility or conductivity? Solubility. I have to make the solution first, and then I can test its conductivity. Okay? So first. Okay? To last. Right? So, uh, sorry. The, the observable properties comes first, but of these three tests, okay, solubility comes first. Okay. So we're not doing any, like, you know, anything that could cause an explosion or you know, violent reaction of any kind in the lab. We're adding water to these compounds. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that when we add water, stuff isn't going to happen. Okay. There are a couple of compounds in the unknowns list where, when you add water to them, there will be some changes. Okay. So when you're doing these tests, okay, you're going to have. Okay, so what you're going to have is equipment like this. You'll have a wash bottle, okay, and it's going to contain distilled water. You're going to have a depression plate or a spot plate, okay, and we call it that because it has depressions in it, not because it's set. Okay. And you're going to have one of these things. I'm sure you've seen one of these before. This is a thermometer. You probably call it a thermometer. But it's the same thing. Okay? And it's going to measure temperature. Okay? Um, what's the little red thing for? That's what you hold it with. That way you don't touch the thermometer and interfere with its reading. Because if I do this, it's going to say hotter than if I'm not doing that. Okay? So you always want to hold it by the little red rubber thing. Now be careful because sometimes they can slide. Okay? Um, you want to kind of squeeze the little rubber thing just to make sure that it's, it's stuck on there real good. Okay, and you're going to have your conductivity meter. Okay, so it's got two prongs at the bottom, nine volt battery on the top, and there's a button on the side. Okay, these ones are way better than the ones we had initially because when you press the button, it actually lights up the on light. The other ones didn't have a light like that, so if you stuck it in something that was non-conductive, you didn't know whether the battery was dead or it was non-conductive because there was no way to tell the difference. Okay, so these are much better. All right. Um, so that's how you'll test the conductivity. You'll simply make the solution, and I'll show you here in a minute okay, what that'll look like. And then obviously you've got your hydrion pH paper. Okay, and on the side of the containers is the scale with the colors, with the color code, what color corresponds to what pH. Okay, and inside you'll have some of the orange strips. Okay, one of these strips should be able to test two different samples. So just tear it in half. Okay, and we can conserve our material. All right, so if I'm testing a material, okay, so um, I just got, let's say, this clear solution here, okay, and I want to test its solubility, okay, what do I do to it? I add water, okay, we're just testing its, its solubility in water, okay, this is already water, so I'm not going to add any more, okay, but while I'm adding the water, I want to have the thermometer in there. Some of the compounds, like I said, that we add, that when we do the solubility test, are going to have changes, temperature changes specifically. When you add water to an acid or water to a base, there will be a temperature increase, okay? Fairly large for the amount of sample that you're going to have. 
you're going to have a small amount of sample and you're going to see probably for some of them a jump of 10, 10 degrees. Okay, which is a lot for the small amount we're going to be using. Okay, so I put the thermometer in the sample and then I begin adding the water. Okay, um, you can stir a little bit with the thermometer, but don't be violent with it because if they break, okay, like the stuff gets everywhere and stinks really bad okay, and stains, like you'll never get it out. You can still see red dots on the floor from what's happened. Okay, not in here. I've broken it in here yet. Okay. Um, so you want to have it in the sample. As you add the water, just give it a stir. Now, given the small amount of everything we have, even if something is highly soluble, is it likely I'd be able to dissolve it all? Probably not. Okay. So how do, how can I tell if it is dissolved? What are some signs I can look for? That it's not separating. Okay. So it's not separating. It's not like floating on top or um, just sinking to the bottom and not doing anything. What are the crystals going to look like if it is dissolving? Smaller. Yeah. They if they were really like sharp edged crystals, they'll probably look rounder. Okay, they'll shrink, they'll maybe look a little more transparent than they did when you first started. Basically, just look for any changes. Also, if you've got a colored solution or a colored salt, the solution will probably, yeah, probably take on that color change to that color. So, that's another sign that it's probably soluble. Okay, if it's liquid to liquid, then again, you're just looking to make sure nothing's floating on top of something else, no, no separation. Okay. All right, so if I am doing the test with this stuff here. Let's say I'm starting with these crystals that I've got in here. All right. So my observable properties would be what color? Blue. Yeah, light blue. Okay. What else? It's crystalline. Okay. You guys probably can't see this, but the crystals are actually like shards as opposed to like squares or cubes. They're almost like what fiberglass looks like. Okay. So they're really thin kind of crystalline shards as opposed to big fat crystals, okay? Um, and there's no discernible odor, okay? So I've wafted it, okay? Um, I think that covers everything. It's blue, it's got no smell, okay? It's shiny, luster, okay? State, it's a solid texture, it's crystalline, okay? It's light blue, translucent, shard-shaped, crystals. Okay, that covers everything in the observable properties test. Okay. Now I'm going to do the solubility test. Okay, so I'm going to put my thermometer in the, in the sample okay, and I'm going to add some water. Okay. So while I'm doing that, I'm keeping an eye on my temperature. Now what should I have recorded before I started this? Yeah, what the temperature was before, which would have been 20 for the temperature. Okay. Um, so while I'm stirring this, I'm seeing basically no changes in the temperature, but what am I seeing with the crystals? It's soluble. Yeah, it's definitely soluble because the solution changed to blue. The powder actually looks a little bit green right now, and it's, it's almost all dissolved. In fact, now it is. Okay, so it's highly soluble. I didn't put very much water in there. I had a fair amount of crystals in there, and they're all gone. Okay, so I would say for my solubility test, no temperature change. Um, highly soluble solution turned blue. Okay, I might even add in there crystals turned green while dissolving. Okay, something like that. Okay, those would be all observations I would put in. Okay, so your solubility test, your observations are going to be more than yes, no. Okay, it's got to be what happened okay, during that part. Okay, what should I do with this before I use it again? What? Yeah, yeah rinse it and dry it. But what should I rinse it with? Tap water or distilled water? Distilled. Distilled. Yeah, you spray this off with your wash bottle and then dry it with a paper towel. Because if you use tap water on it, you could put ions on it, which would interfere with the next test. Okay? All right. So I've tested that now. Now I'm going to do the conductivity test. Okay? So if I'm comparing here just the water, okay, that's distilled water. Conductivity is one. Okay, it basically means non-conductive. Okay, I put it in this stuff. Okay, so I don't know why three are lit up there. Something going wonky with this thing. It's a battery. Plan. Okay, but it was highly conductive, right? When I first pressed it there, it was like nine. Okay, so very highly conductive, and I would write even on there nine out of ten. Okay, your scales from nine to from one to ten, 
put the put on the scale. No. Okay. So is that an ionic compound then? Definitely. Okay. Now, just because I grabbed something kind of at random, okay, um, what does it likely contain because of its color? Copper, it's blue. Okay, this stuff is it's copper two chloride. Okay, now if that was on my list, that's what I would pick. A because it's blue. It's the only blue thing I would have. Okay, but also it was clearly ionic because it was crystalline, conducted electricity in solution. Okay, all of that kind of stuff. Now I got one test left. I don't really need to do it to identify it. Okay? But I need to do it in order to make sure I have a full set of data and eliminate any errors. Okay? And that is my pH test. So with the pH test, okay, with a colored solution, you have to be a bit more careful. Okay? So I'm going to tear this in half. Okay? With the clear solution, okay, which was just water, okay, I put it in there. All right, yeah, it's obviously 7. Okay? Water is neutral. Now, with the colored solution, okay, I've just got to be a bit more careful that the color doesn't interfere with my reading. Okay. This reading is about a, probably a 4, maybe a 5. Okay. It's darker than 6, so 4 or 5. Right. Is that a strong acid? Okay, it's just slightly acidic. Okay. It's obviously not anything containing hydrogen acting as the metal. That's all I would have to do. Okay, I record my observations when I've got all of the, all of the things tested. Okay, then I can go back and figure out what's what. Okay, don't try and figure it out along the way. Have your full suite of data first, and then go back. Okay, so that's what you'll be doing on Monday. Okay, it shouldn't take us too long to do the procedure. Okay, uh, and we're going to have a bit of tomorrow's class and all of Friday's class to get kind of the laboratory <laughs> started. Talk about format. Okay, all of that kind of stuff, and and then on Monday you'll have the lab and then maybe a little bit of time after we do the lab to work on analysis and conclusion and stuff like that. Okay. How many of you have written up a full lab report before? Okay, good. So you kind of know uh, what we're looking at here. We'll, we'll go over the expectations okay, for a lab report. Um, we might get into a bit of it today, okay, but for sure we'll cover the rest of it tomorrow. Okay. Alright, any questions on that stuff there and how that's going to work? Okay. I'm going to give you another two, three minutes here, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, lab report format. So, just want to kind of quickly talk about the formats. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, just kind of lay out what the, what the layout of your um, lab reports are going to be in this, uh, in this course. Okay? So, with our lab report kind of format slash expectations, obviously we're going to want okay, you to have First off, start with a problem. Okay, you may have had problem or question, depending on your teacher. Either one is right. Okay, we just use problem here. Okay, so the problem is, what am I investigating? Okay, so it could be as simple as something like this: What is the effect of light on plant growth? Okay, obviously we probably wouldn't have something that simple, but okay, um, that's the problem we're investigating. Okay, or um, you know, why does the sun go down in the west? Or you know, whatever. It can be a simple problem, a question. Okay, that we're trying to investigate. Okay. From there, we have our design. Within the design is going to be where you're going to identify your manipulated, your responding, your controlled variables, okay, and explain them. Okay, the explanation part is important, and I'll go into more detail about that. Okay, these two things here, okay, make up five marks of your 30 marks on the typical lab report. The first lab report is actually going to be out of 35 because we're also going to write out the procedure. That's the only report we do that on. Okay, the rest will all be out of 30. Okay, ah, so this would be five marks. So having the problem stated as a question in your own words. I always have a problem written out on the lab sheet that I give you, or electronic sheet that I give you. Okay, you just have to put it in your own words in the form of a question. So it's kind of like Jeopardy. Okay. Then for the design, okay, you get manipulated, responding, and controlled variables. Three controlled variables with explanations. Okay, so that's going to total five marks, those two things. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about the specifics of the variables tomorrow. Okay, then after that is your hypothesis. Okay, now your hypothesis is a deductive statement. Right? It's not a guess. You know, sometimes people have this impression that your hypothesis is a guess. It's not. Okay, we never guess in science. Right? We come up with deductive reasoning, and your hypothesis is a deductive reasoning statement. If 
the following is true, or if the following works like this, okay, and an experiment like this is run, measuring this and that, then these will be the results, okay? That's how we state a hypothesis. If this is true, and an experiment like this is run, then the results will be this. That's how I'll know if I'm right, okay? Is if my predicted results happen, right? We don't actually come out and say, well, the sun causes plants to grow. That's not a hypothesis. It's a statement, okay, but it's not a hypothesis. A hypothesis needs to have deductive reasoning okay, within. All right, and we'll talk again more tomorrow about the details of the hypothesis. The hypothesis itself is also worth five marks, okay? That simple one statement okay, is worth five marks on your lab report. Okay, then you'll have your procedure, which in all cases except this first lab is going to be already written out for me, by me, sorry, okay, for you, and you just have to follow it. Okay, uh, so there's not gonna be any marks for that other than this lab where you're gonna write it out, but I've already kind of told you what the, what the procedure is or what tests we're running, you just have to put the details in, okay? You're gonna have observations, okay? Your observations are three marks. That's any and all things that you record during the lab, okay? They could be actual measurements, okay? How far did the cart travel and how long did it take for it to do it? Those would be actual measurements, numbers, okay? And sometimes it's gonna be qualitative stuff like the solution turned blue, okay? Or the plant grew measurement, that'd be like three centimeters. Uh, the plant looked healthy, that's a qualitative observation, okay? There's no good or bad, okay? Qualitative observations are just as valid and just as important as, qualitative, as quantitative observations, okay? Measured versus observed, okay? It's all fine, okay? We record anything in there, including any charts and graphs or any other data, okay? Then in your analysis is where you will take your observations and try to figure out what they're saying. Okay, what are they telling you about the relationship you were investigating? Okay, so they, you might be doing some calculations. You might be reviewing and comparing data between different plants. If I was doing an experiment on the growth, the effect of sunlight on plant growth, I would probably have a plant that was in the dark, a plant that got 24 hours of sun and a half a dozen plants in between, okay? And I would be comparing their growth rates. Okay, that would be comparisons of data. Okay, for you guys, most of the time, it's gonna consist of you answering the questions that I give in the analysis or doing any calculations that I ask you to perform. Okay, but they'll have to do with the observations that you have made. Okay, then in your conclusion, okay, that's, sorry, the analysis is worth five marks. Okay, uh, then you have your conclusion where you'll copy and paste your hypothesis. You don't need to rewrite it, just copy and paste it. Okay, and then using your data and your analysis, Okay, so you talk about those things, you would tell me whether your hypothesis is accepted or rejected. Okay, this is four marks. Writing down, I was right, or it worked just like I said it would, would get you one out of four, if you're lucky. Okay, that is not a conclusion, that's bragging. Okay, or I was wrong, well that's sad, but also, also worth only one mark. Okay, you have to state, you have to say in there, the observations that were made, that would be these things that I saw, this plant grew more than that plant, okay, would indicate that sunlight does have a positive effect to a point on the growth of plants, therefore my hypothesis is accepted or rejected, or whatever it happens to be. Okay, you talk about the data, you talk about your hypothesis, you talk about how they relate to each other, okay, and then you accept or reject. You don't just say, I was right, la di da for you, okay? Yeah, you gotta have a little more explanation in there. Okay, and then your last bit here is your evaluation. Okay, it's out of three marks. You list two sources of error. So that would be anything that you thought could have been done better in the lab to do with the design, not to do with anything you did. Okay, so simply saying like, um, there wasn't very much sample. It was hard to make observations on a small amount of sample. Improvement could be to have a larger sample in the next, the next time the lab is performed. But that's finding a source of error, explaining how it affected the experiment and how you could fix it, okay? Saying, uh, yeah, I mixed up samples B and C, so I got bad data and that really affected how my lab went. That's human error, okay? That's not an experimental error, that's you admitted you did something wrong, did nothing about it, complained about it, and suggested no improvements, okay? That's not a source of error. And you definitely don't want that to be the last thing I read in your lab report. Okay, because if I read in your lab report, the last thing is, ah, uh, yeah, good error. I screwed up the lab, did it wrong, I didn't go back and fix it, 
and it really affected my data. Message sent to Coder. Coder, I was really lazy, screwed up, didn't knew I did, and didn't do anything. Okay? That's not how you want to end the, the, the report for me. Okay, so it's got to be something within the design that you could do nothing about. That's a source of error. Okay, and then at the end, there's five marks for simply the overall impression that your lab report makes. Is it in the right format? Is it thorough? Okay, um, you know, stuff like that. The full of spelling mistakes, grammar errors. Okay? If I'm stumbling over your writing, that's not good. Okay. All right, we'll talk more in detail about that uh, tomorrow. If everybody can quickly just wipe down, mask up first, everybody mask up. Okay, before anybody gets moving, and wipe down those desks.